of the people that I was at uni with, she basically ended up going into the prison service. And she called me up one day and she said, there are no black people here. Right. I really think you need to come and join the prison service. Mm. So I was very reluctant at first, mm. um, but I spoke to some of the young people that I was mentoring. They themselves said to me, they explained and described their experience. And some of them were just hellish, to be as really? blunt as I can. And they said, we have nobody that looks like us when we go inside. Wow. You have to do this. Wow. So they were my first point of changing my mind, thinking actually this is coming from the very, um, you know, demographics that it impacted. And so, yeah, I um, joined and I became the first black female in the UK to wow. join in that particular establishment at that time, I was 22. Wow. They'd never had, it was a youth establishment. They'd never had um, any black females that had worked there. Anne-Marie, I'm really glad to talk with you today about stuff like this, about justice and what it means. You know, it's something that we talk about together all the time <laughs> in our yeah. conversations. We always end, it, end up going there. <laughs> It's great because um, the Passionists, we're doing it really in conjunction with them. The Passionist is a mon monastic order that is dedicated to sort of living out the passion of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and this idea of suffering, living, dying and being resurrected with him. And it's something that they, they live out and they live it out through prayer, but also through community. Mm. And they have a strong bent towards social justice, you know, suffering with those that suffer. And so when they asked us to come on and talk about this, although we're not from like the same denomination, I think we both, you and I are very passionate about justice. Yeah. We know it's a very broad subject, but we're going to talk about a narrow part of what that means. But so you, you now work in the youth justice space. Yeah. Um, you're really passionate about that, about transforming those things. Before we get into what is justice and what it means, sure. tell me a little bit about how you got into that and why sure. you got into that. So I've worked with in the youth justice and related um, mm -hmm. fields now for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a very urban inner city community mm -hmm. and I saw, to be honest, injustice all around me. Mm -hmm. um, very, very aware at a young age. Um, I had things that happened to myself in my own um, personal life that gave me um, a real sense of injustice and a real sense of this is not okay. And remembering um, at, at a child's age, so I was about, I was 11, and I remember really vividly thinking, I have no control over this situation. And I felt powerless and voiceless. Mm. And I thought, I never want to experience that type of wow. feeling again. And I think wow. it triggered something in me for the rest of my life to speak and fight for those who couldn't speak and fight for themselves. And I remember almost making an, almost like an inner vow to myself that one day when I'm old enough yeah. and I have that power yeah. and authority, I will speak and I will fight for, for, for justice. Because mm. I remember as a child thinking, I don't know how to do that yet. Yeah. Um, so I think it was something that was always there. Some, and so seeing a lot of people get into injustice, then an incident happened in our own family. And when I saw the level of kind of injustices um, in the legal system, mm. the just complete unfair treatments, the inequity around being having access to um good lawyers and access mm. to even understanding where to approach. If you've never been involved in the criminal justice system, you wouldn't even know where to approach. You don't even know how to start these things and you mm. don't have access or knowledge. So um, just seeing continual barriers in society over, over years. Um, so I always wanted to do something about it, but I never quite knew what. Mm -hmm. um, eventually I went to university and I studied criminal justice and I specialised in juvenile justice um, and psychology. And it was through having this sense of, you know, having the academia now and starting to understand society and sociology and all of these different things. Um, so I knew I wanted to work in that space. Um, and I just hadn't kind of figured out, you know, how I started mentoring um, in the community. And I was mentoring young people who were at risk of um, getting involved in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that I was at uni with, she basically ended up going into the prison service. And she called me up one day and she basically said, I'm in the prison service. And um, she said, she was a, a white friend. And she said, basically there are no 
black people here. Right. But at the time, this is time 20 plus years ago, she said at the time, there were significant proportion of kids from uh, children of black heritage and other uh, communities. Gypsy Roma traveler community was quite high as well. Um, and then, you know, lots of different smaller mm-hmm. underrepresented mm-hmm. communities that were in custody with no representation. Right. And so she was like, I really think you need to come and join the prison service. Mm. So in my community, (laughs) that was like a big taboo and absolutely would have been seen as a betrayal and you absolutely cannot, you know, join a prison service and and, um, in their mind lock people up. It was just Mm. something that would just be completely taboo and and not okay. So I was very reluctant at first, Mm. um, but I spoke to some of the young people that I was mentoring. They themselves said to me, they explained and described their experience and some of them were just hellish to be as blunt as I can. And they said, we have nobody that looks like us when we go inside. You have to do this. So they were my first point of changing my mind, thinking actually this is coming from the very, um, you know, demographics that are impacted. And so, yeah, I um, joined and I became the first black female in the UK to join in that particular establishment, at that time I was 22, wow. they'd never had, it was a youth establishment, they'd never had um, any black females that had worked there. And so why do you think it is so important? I mean, it's obviously, it sounds like a bit of an obvious question, but mm. why do you think it is so important for people that are in these spaces, these young men, was mm. it a male? For, yeah. So, yeah, these young men to see themselves, see someone like them, mm sort of I guess looking after them if you like because that's what prison officers do don't they yeah that's what they should do that's what they should do yeah. <laughs> whether whether they all get that memo is a <laughs> other story but yeah um so for for those kids I think predominantly having experienced multiple failures mm. so the systems itself you know some people argue that it you know to get by the time you get to custody you've been failed by 18 different social structures right. or systems Um, So they've been through so much to even get to that place. So by the time they're there, they're very traumatised, high mental health um, challenges, multiple levels of deprivation and not having the cognitive um, space or spectrum or even equipping to be able to cope with those situations. It's scary. People, you know, love to say that, you know, holiday camps and things like this. I I challenge people all the time until you go in and experience what it is for a child. Mm -hmm to be in a custodial setting, which I think is just completely inhumane. Um, even though I'm not saying that the the people who are working there are not doing their best, mm-hmm. but it's just not normal to mm-hmm. lock up children I, I, I yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so for the children, back to your question, they, they look for what's familiar. Right. They look for what they feel safe. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. quite often in our communities, the women, the matriarch role right. is auntie, sister, yeah, mummy. Yeah, yeah. They're looking for that. They, you know, years and years of not only being traumatised and failed by certain mm-hmm. systems, but then the narrative that's come down through the generations is to fear predominantly people that don't look like you, predominantly mm-hmm. people of white backgrounds in, you know, uniforms and things like that it's met with threat if you think of the years of you know our histories and the stories that are told down to children Mm -hmm. so they've already got a fear complex they've already then they've already experienced the inequalities in the system they do not trust the authorities those who every structure if we think of every social institution that was set up to safeguard them Mm -hmm. at some point has not worked right predominantly in the majority of cases and it's not to apportion blame um Mm -hmm. i don't apportion blame to families and parents because there are so many issues that Mm -hmm. can lead to you know why a child has ended up in that situation but nevertheless that's their reality Mm -hmm. so to have a just someone that feels like a safe space prisons are cold prisons are um scary they are Mm -hmm. not friendly places they are dangerous and you know and i've as i said i've worked the entire spectrum um, and, and I still work within the, the same sort of field I've done the whole the whole <laughs> end-to-end justice is what they say right. so I've predominantly worked every aspect of the, of the youth justice um, right. sector and yeah it's not you know and there are some amazing people mm-hmm. I, I want mm-hmm. to labour that amazing people working mm-hmm. in, in that mm-hmm. space but ultimately yeah yeah children should just not, not be locked up <laughs> well we're gonna get into that we're yeah talk about that more <laughs> about Um, you know why sort of youth justice reform Mm. but I just want us to sort of 
you know, lay the foundation about sure. why why we're here. So you have this justice thing. I know that, you know, I, I studied human rights law. I, mm. I More from a sort of international human rights thing. And my parents were in um, academia and the justice space just because it was, you know, these people were fighting against, you know, the apartheid system because mm. my father is South African and it was apartheid South Africa and he was in exile in this country but I'm really, I, I sort of want to frame the conversation. Obviously, this is, you know, we are both believers. We both believe in Jesus, you know. And I'm really interested in talking about justice within the context of what the Bible says about it, what Jesus thinks about it. Mm. And also, um, you know, in, in the context of the world we're in right now and is the church relevant when it comes to talking about these things, mm. Um, but before we do that, I think it would be really helpful to sort of ask ourselves, what does justice mm. actually mean? Yeah. You have contravened and breached all of the laws of justice. Mm -hmm. You who's been appointed to rule in righteousness and fairness and, and all of the oaths that, that the people in office take, which are very much centred on biblical yeah. oaths, break them, mm -hmm. then you've given license and legitimacy for others to break them. Mm 